So you grew up watching Pokemon. Maybe even a bit of Dragon Ball Z on your Toonami. Perhaps you're a bit older and you saw Akira when it first came out and you feel like you got a pretty good grasp of what anime is. But I have news for you. You have no idea what is actually out there. For years, anime and anime fans have had a terrible stigma surrounding them that they're just weirdos and what the Japanese called otakus, right? If that's the right way to say it, it sounds like I said tacos. <laughs> but the guy from uh, Metal Gear Solid, right? And that's fair, but if we're being real, right? Every genre, every media, every thing has its weirdos and fanatics, but not everybody that enjoys something is that stereotype. Now, to be frank, usually on this channel, we leave things like stereotypes to the idiots that we know don't think further than what they see. But anime really does get a bad rap for a number of reasons. But the most poignant reason it gets a bad rap is because of the Western world, right? Anime is not appreciated like it should be. Anime in particular, which is a style of animation, has found itself being undermined and overlooked for the past 10 to 20 years in media. And that's just the 2000s, right? There was a certain level of respect for animation and a style of animation from the 90s backwards, right? Which we've seemed to have lost touch with. Now, before I get into my spiel about why you should be an anime bro and make anime your identity, which I, I really don't want to see that happen to you, but you, it might, right? But before we get into that, Let's just break down the basics, not in a woo-woo way, but in a very straightforward way. What is anime? Anime is short for animation. What is an animation? An animation is a moving drawing. All right, what is a drawing? Well, now we're getting to the base of it, right? The very first things that we know made by human beings on the planet are drawings, they're not writing, they're not buildings, they're drawings. Learning how to draw is a very important part of becoming a fully rounded human being. So if you can't draw, you have very little visual sense, you have much less visual sense. So you're educating your visual sense, you're educating yourself to understand the dance of colors and shapes all around you. If you look around us at beautifully made buildings, um, great signs, great advertising, we are completely surrounded by drawn and or, if things that were once drawn, once sketched out by a human hand and a human mind and a human heart. I hate to put things in economistic terms because drawing is about being more alive and being more human and having a richer sense of yourself ultimately. But if you're asking, does it affect the economy, does it affect the wider society? Absolutely it does. It's, it's central and not peripheral. The difference between drawing as art and drawing as cognition is that the moment we see drawing as art, our focus will be on what the child has drawn. And the moment we shift, uh, you know, we see drawing as cognition, then our interest is more will be about, about which the child is drawing. It's very clear from the thousands of drawings that we have studied, where children have been completely left free to explore the world. If we use the word art, we are diverting the child. For example, even if we give color, we are again diverting the child. You know, because the initial engagement with the real world is, is for the child just through lines, you know. It's, actually, it's almost like outlines of the world, the form is being explored. You know? So drawing that way reduces the, the, the distractions and focus again and again back on the world itself. So, so play is also similar to that, you know? toy is also similar to that. The moment you give a toy, then that activity will become play. But if there is no toy, the child will recreate the world and for that he will use whatever is available. A drawing is something that is so innate, so human, so viscerally base function human being that everyone can do it but not everyone can do art right almost everybody out there who wasn't entirely deprived of a childhood can recall some point in time where you had a pencil a pen a crayon or maybe even a stone and you would take that tool and you would begin to scribble it was probably nonsense and maybe for some of you it was probably excellent but the thing is with that experience of actually creating something bringing something to fruition from your mind even if it's good or bad on a piece of paper on the floor on your mum's walls on the linen right connects you to something deeper than just being a modern human there really is no such thing as art there are only artists that's a quote from eh gombrich's the story of art drawing is a laughably broad concept that can invade a life at a moment's notice i think people are drawing when they rearrange their furniture i feel like i'm drawing while speaking this I'm creating rhythms, designing points of emphasis, doing broad strokes, adding little details, and most importantly, I'm orchestrating contrast, just with my voice. It's all one practice. For centuries, the simple act of drawing has been a way to communicate our personal realities, tell stories, leave messages, and plan. When you think about what language is, and you just step back and take a look at a simple thing like the alphabet, it's really just symbols. And what are symbols? drawings right so if we go a bit further back before we get our hieroglyphs and our ancient sanskrit we had drawings right now 
I know it sounds like, oh, well, I know that, bro. Why are you telling me that? But I don't think you really understand, right? The reason an anime is important is because it's that, a drawing. Human expression comes from inside our minds and communication comes from our ability to observe our universe and put it down in a way that somebody else can understand or interpret what we see, right? That's how we have shared languages, symbols that become words, that becomes writing. Now, this isn't a big deal, but it really is, right? I would say drawing is an essential part of our everyday toolkit, really. Um, we use drawing for communication primarily. So me and my partner, we, when we are talking to one another, we'll use drawings um, like the like ones here, just really casual drawings just to get the point across. So what are you talking about? This. And in a quick drawing, you can, you can resolve any, a question that might have taken half an hour to talk through. Um, so this is a 3D model, which is based on um, a, a sketch in a sketchbook and refined through drawing, 3D modeling, printing out, redrawing in this kind of loop system. So it's, it's, the drawing there becomes an iterative part of the design process. We've put drawing into this dark corner of the art world, but drawing is not only about artistic excellence, personal self-expression or talent for that matter. Drawing is not about art. Drawing is bigger than art. It's a way to think in pictures, like an architect does when she tries to imagine a new building, or a scientist tries to figure out the spatial structure of molecules. These people are not only thinking in words, they're also thinking in pictures. They think visually. It's much easier to just recognize things around us instead of actually looking. We reduce the word to labels, but when we draw, we actually have to look and discover the world around us. The labels disappear, and we see what is actually there right now. We situate ourselves in the world, and because we pay such intense attention to what is around us, it becomes a part of us. The word tree is a public placeholder for all sorts of trees. Now, you could say, okay, these imaginations, these personal imaginations that we have, are different for every one of us, so they're useless for communication. We should focus on the word, the common ground. And I would say, if we do that, we're missing out. The problem with words, why, they, why it's so hard to anchor them is, it's hard to relate them to personal experiences. Now, a drawing can build a bridge between the personal experience of a tree and the abstract expression of it, the word, the conventional word. Five ways how drawing can support your thinking. It can ignite our intuition, make our lives more beautiful, help us understand, imagine new things, and share them with others. If you make drawing a daily habit, it will be a dramatic improvement for your thinking. And please remember, our drawings do not have to be pieces of art. If they help us to think and connect with others, they are good enough. The first photograph didn't appear in human history until 1822. So what do you think humanity was doing before 1822? They were drawing, they were painting, right? Portraits, landscapes, plans, schematics, all of these things were drawn, right? Even for some of you out there, pornography could be found on cave walls, right? We've always drawn. So in my humble opinion, that's one of the reasons why human minds connect so deeply with the idea of drawing. And it doesn't even have to be a good drawing or a colored drawing, right? Everybody can draw, but not everybody can do art. So one of the reasons I feel like anime doesn't get the respect it deserves is that people, normal people, normies, don't actually understand or appreciate what it takes to create animation, let alone what it takes to produce a photograph or a movie or how their Instagram works. They have no idea how any of these processes work. They just see it, get instructions and copy. If you was to just step back for a second, and understand, even from the olden days where animation was done frame by frame, what's a frame? Frame is a slice of a picture that you're seeing right now. So you're watching a video that is shot in 60 frames per second, right? So for every second that goes by, there's 60 little snapshots happening so fast that your mind doesn't even recognize it. And it's just one smooth video, right? Hardly any animations are 60 frames per second. Cause you know what that would mean, right? 60 drawings per second to make a character move, right? So we just step back a little bit and appreciate how the first machines that people created, because I haven't got the words for it or the names or the history off the top of my head, but there's like little spinning machines where people would take a picture, draw it three or four times, put it in this little machine, right? And it would spin and you would see from the outside that it looks like an animation happening, right? From that to now is technology. It's progress it's human intelligence and development that brings us to what we have today what we call anime or animation now there's 3d technology animation which you would say is what pixar represents then there's traditional animation which what you would say is manga right taking a picture book a comic strip and drawing the frames enough times to make the characters move, right? And then you get from manga to anime. Manga comes about because of ancient scrolls in Japan, right? It was just background drawing to tell the story that they were telling on the scrolls, right? This is 12th century 
technology, right? Because it's technology, technique, tools, technology, right? And it progresses up to modern times, right? And in the 1900s, you get your first actual animations. But anyway, like I said, we're not here to talk about the history of anime. If you want to find that out, do a couple Googles, check out a couple of videos. Maybe I'll even recommend a few in the comments, right? People generally don't actually understand how much skill art and effort goes into making animation. Now, a lot of skill, art and effort and technological progress goes into making movies and shows too, but it's a different mindset, right? Both use tools from each other. To make a good movie, you have to make a storyboard. And what is a storyboard? It's a comic strip. And if you put a comic strip together, you get an animation, okay? So they both share the same cinematic principles and tools, but they produce different art, different media forms. The 12 principles of animation are the basic fundamentals of traditional animation. Coined by legendary animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, the rules have become crucial guidelines for anyone entering the animation profession. Based on the storyboards, the recording script is written. Layout is critical. All the character arrangements, positions, and movements are placed on the background. Once the layout is complete, the key animation is drawn. In order to get the correct timing of the key animation, the time sheet is made. It shows the length of each shot and the necessary camera movement, as well as plan out the rest of the production process. After the key drawings are timed and completed, they are checked, and the finished art is sent off for the in-between process. In-between images are drawn to smooth out the character's movements. Once the drawings are done, they're checked to make sure that the movements are smooth, and that everything is done in accordance with the time sheets, which is critical. The next step is the color process. Color schemes are created for each character, and uh, depending on the setting, they may change whether it's day or night. Then we go to the scanner, where the finished animation is scanned in page by page, and then digitally colored. The finished background art, amazing as it is, is scanned into the old computer and reviewed. Because of the limitations of 2D animation, they use three-dimensional and retouching software, which I'm not even sure how it works. I'm just glad that it does. So if you, as a modern consumer, could just take a moment or two in your daily life to look at the things you actually like and appreciate and go and find out how they're made, just like we used to watch the show How It's Made, right? You would have a newfound appreciation for the culture in which you reside, right? And the things that you take for granted, like movies and anime. But the deep thing is this, I haven't watched an English or American made TV show in about five or six years and I don't think I'm ever going to go back, but I'm not what you would call an otaku either, right? But there's something to be said for the art form that is animation over what we have today, which we call TV programming. So yes, there is a sense of now that anime is becoming more accessible and more popularized, you get different types of people introduced to the art form and they start to build their own culture surrounding it. But what happens is you get two types of people. You get the fakers or posers, and then you get the pretentious snobs, right? You don't wanna be either of those two people because both think they know more than they actually do, right? You just wanna have an objective view and appreciate art. Right, if you can just be in the middle of those two people, you could be better off for it. Anime is not an identity. Although human beings will find anything to politicize and drag into their agendas and their culture, anime itself cannot be an identity. And I know that sounds like I'm just picking on a group of people, but I'll break it down to you quite simply like this, right? Big corporations are all about making money and it, it never starts with a corporation. It always starts with a person, an idea, a business, then it reaches out, it spreads out. But the idea of animation being eaten and incorporated into this big machine that is modern culture or capitalism, right? Because I hate, I hate even having to go down this road, right? But it's, it needs to be said, right? Anime was a fringe media not just a fringe media in terms of, oh, only weirdos and artsy fartsy people watch that. No, anime originally was used as part of the propaganda machine for war, right? So people would make animations and posters regarding war times, right? So anime is a serious tool, but it's also a fringe media, right? But as it becomes more popular, you, you get things like modern companies buying the rights from studios to be able to take characters and put them on things, right? So you might walk down the street in England, right? And see a random person walking down the street in a Dragon Ball Z shirt, right? And you'll think, oh shit, they know about Dragon Ball Z. But no, do you know what happened? They went to their local Primark and they saw this colorful shirt that other people are wearing and they wanted one too. They don't understand anything about Dragon Ball Z. That's part of the corporate consumption of culture and manipulating people into being itemized, right? Into being tools. 
Now, although they become somewhat tools or, or corporate shields, right, to go ahead and progress this agenda a bit more, they also help the culture spread to genuine people that are interested in the arts and the format that is animation. So it's not all bad, but even me saying it like that makes me sound a bit snobby. But it's, it's not that I'm snobby, it's that I actually appreciate it as much as I can, but not to the point where I can tell you what to do. You have every right to just be a consumer and never produce and never think anything deeper than what you see. But as a person, for your own human enrichment while you're on this planet, you have a duty to make yourself better. And if you only follow what's been fed to you, what's been pre-produced, pre-packaged with that agenda, advertising and politics embedded in it, you will only become worse off for the future. And not only you will suffer, your friends will suffer, your family will suffer, your children will suffer, your culture will suffer because of a simple thing like not knowing how stuff is made, why people put certain messaging in certain products, right? And the simple thing is you forgetting that just a hundred or so years ago, right? A little bit more now, a thing like a drawing, a portrait and a painting was held in high regard and high esteem in comparison to now what you believe matters more than anything else, some pixels on a screen, all right? So don't forget that. Don't lose touch with what has been just so you can pretend to be a part of what's to come because you never will and you will help slow down the progress of humanity by buying into all of these already done ideas that you've been sold in TV and movies and shit, right? Start complaining, start telling them we want some new ideas, we want some original thoughts, we want to learn, we want morals and philosophy back in our fucking content, all right? And once you do that, things will start getting better. But if you keep buying it, if you keep going to Primark and buying fucking Dragon Ball Z shirts and have no idea what fucking Dragon Ball Z is, you're only making life worse for yourself. What is my personal love of anime? Where does it come from, right? So I was born in the 90s in England. And as a kid, I had an older brother and cousins. Now my older brother and cousins were about in their teens going on 20s when I was still a young boy, right? Before I had even reached the age of 10, yeah? So they were experiencing the culture of Japanese art much earlier than I would have, right? So I got to see their comics, their videotapes of manga, right? Their enjoying of the culture. The first time I was introduced to things like PlayStation and Nintendo is because of my older brother and cousins, right? Things like Metal Gear Solid, things like Zelda, right? So this is in this is in the culture of the youth in England at the time. And they were born in the 70s and the 80s, right? So I got to experience animation or Japanese culture secondhand through my older brother. But not just that, right? He got to experience Asian culture secondhand through my dad's generation, which is the 50s and 60s. And where did they get their experience of Asian culture? From Kung Fu films, right? And also from that wartime propaganda, the leftover residue of it. So before I get into my personal experience with animation, I have to explain a bit. Why would black people, right, just random West Indian descendant black people in England be so immersed in Asian culture? Well, if you look at immigration, the pattern of immigration from the Western world and the Eastern world, blacks and Asians have always ended up in similar places, right? Not to say that we're treated the same because we never were, or our economic opportunities were the same because they never were, but we end up in similar places and culture clashing, right? So we mix a little, but that's not the reason why black people in the 50s, 60s, 70s, until now, are more likely to be open-minded to Asian culture and media. The reason is quite simple, but quite deep at the same time. As a black person, the media you ingest in the West does not represent you. And for the most part, its inception was designed to propagandize people against you, right? And I'm not just saying that, you can actually do the research. I might even put up a few clips just now for you to see. <laughs> That's it. 
here cruising around through the evil waves over the waterfalls and the snow-clad mountains and, and over the great American desert, that may be all right for them, of course. But does you remember when we was in the African Navy? Yeah. Oh, that was, no, was, was we a couple of animals then, or was we a couple of animals? Oh, boy, did that show was the happy time, huh? Oh, oh we was back there now again, y'all, sir. Boy, we only had that old battle wagon again. We could show step out and take Zulu land, couldn't we? Oh, oh. oh, we was only there. and villainized in Western media, in magazines, in newspaper, in comic clippings, in animation, right? Some early Disney shit and in films and shows, right? You get demonized, you get stereotyped and you get treated badly. But it wasn't just us, right? Although we got the worst brunt of it through history, Asians got it too. Now, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, more Asian culture started to get introduced to the West. That was their films, their dress style, their food, their media, all right? Now, for a black person growing up during those times until now, it's easier for you to identify with the stories being told of the underdogs and all of those kinds of things in Kung Fu movies than with the Western media of being the power player, right? And everyone else is underneath white people, right? It's easier to identify with Asian culture because even people like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Samuel Hung, all of these people went through this kind of shit too, fighting to get put on an equal playing field with these big powerhouses, right? It was never as simple as just making Kung Fu movies, right? It was very political. The agendas, the storytelling, what was allowed to be shown to us and what wasn't, right? So all of that trickles down through my dad's generation to my older brother's generation and then to me, right? And then to you, right? So that's how we get here with blacks having a certain level of appreciation for Asian culture, even though Asian culture and media also stereotypes and demonizes black people, but they get it from white people too, right? So in the 90s, right, coming up to the 2000s, on TV in Britain, we had two channels. One was called the Sci-Fi Channel and one was called Bravo, right? This is just around the time when a little bit later, no, a little bit prior to when Toonami was introduced to the Cartoon Network series, like franchise, right? So this is before that, just a little bit before that. So this is my brother's and cousin's age, right? So this would be early 90s, late 80s, right, coming in. Now they would, of course, have VHS tapes. Back in the day, people actually had their own personal video VHS shops, right? Where you could order videos from other countries in the world and they would stock it for you and you can come and buy it, right? That, that's how much media has changed, right? And just think about it, it's only like 30 years ago, right? They would record these animation shows, right? And these animation films, right? Which, would, which was mostly through the company that called themselves Manga. So we would associate this particular type of anime style with the word manga. Most of us didn't know that manga was its own genre in drawing, right? We just thought anime that looks like that is called manga, right? Because it comes from manga, right? So that's how we got those things. We got things like um, 
Guyver, Three by Three Eyes, Devil Man, um, of course Akira and stuff like that. But then there was more like uh, alternative anime, like Pat Labor, Appleseed, stuff like that, right? Which had deeper levels of storytelling and narratives, right? Like I said, the art form is much deeper than what you think it is. It's very much political. It's very much philosophical, right? It's it's an art, right? So I got to experience that kind of animation and um, Eastern culture secondhand through my brothers and cousins, the older generation, right? So I was watching these animes as a kid. And of course, I was only drawn to it because it was a drawing, right? That same visceral thing as a child, you see a comic book, you, you see a drawing, you get a coloring book and you wanna participate in this performance of reality, bringing imagination into being, right? So that's why as a kid, you get caught up into these kinds of things. But of course, there's a certain level of programming because the truth is cartoons were never made for kids. Cartoons were made for adults then adapted to children's shows, right? But anyway, that's my personal history with manga as a child, right? And then growing up, I got my Cartoon Network, so I got my Toonamis, I got my Dragon Ball Z, and on and on it went, right? I remember the, I specifically remember the night I saw Ghost in the Shell, right? And I think straight after that, right? Because we were, because we were poor, we saw everything later than when it was released, right? But straight after that, I saw The Matrix, right? So you can just imagine the time, right? And as a child, having your eyes open to this kind of art, these kind of ideas, right? It's, it's very, impressionable but that's me that's my childhood with anime right and growing up i consumed more and more animation as i got older right and of course i was still very much entrenched in popular culture which was had nothing to do with anime and anime was a, a frowned upon side thing right you might have caught one or two shows like i said on cartoon network or fox kids but it wasn't main primetime disney kind of stuff right so because the type of anime or manga i grew up watching wasn't so mainstream it was something that was more cultural to the people around me like i just said my older brothers and cousins and one or two friends that knew about it too but it wasn't mainstream although later i got to realize that a lot of the stuff we grew up watching was informing the skills the techniques and the new like camera and cgi things that hollywood began to use like i just said things in ghost in the shell were incorporated into a movie or into a genre defining movie like the matrix right so a lot of anime stuff was informing where hollywood would go for the next 20 years and they still are to this day which is why right you should appreciate the reality of manga and anime the storytelling and the ideas and the creativity that is done in it because it's informing all of the johnny come lately stuff that you think is so cool now right it's old shit recycled so as an adult why did I decide to turn away from watching Western movies and shows and go back to more traditional anime, particularly vintage anime? It's quite simple. The first half of the journey back into animation was of course nostalgia. Remembering the stories, the videos, the soundtracks of those original animes I watched on VHS as a kid. And the other half of it was realizing the state of our modern society, right? And I'm not saying that as if I had some enlightenment, I just learned a bit more. I just saw a bit more and I got to see a little bit behind the wizard's curtain, which is why I recommend for the average person watching this, go and find out how your favorite things are made, right? It's, it's not as simple as, oh yeah, I like cake, so I wanna find out the ingredients. It's a, bit, it's a bit deeper than that, right? You don't know why you like cake till you find out why cake exists. All right, so that's just an example. Of course, as a 90s kid, I watched a whole bunch of Hollywood movies from all the biggest studios in the world and a whole shitload of Disney movie indoctrination like every 90s kid did, right? But as you get older, coming from that era, you got to see the decline of storytelling and the rise of agenda and politics in all of your media, right? It's advertising, agenda, and politics. These are prioritized in Western media now. It's not the storytelling. It's not even, it's not even, um, giving actors a chance and casting and stuff like that. It's the same people making the same stories with the same money to get the same customer, right? And that's, that's why Disney has done what it's done with the Marvel Universe, right? Because they 
use that formula. Disney isn't really releasing any original IPs like they did in the 90s, right, in the 80s. They're, they're not. They're looking at what works and they're doing it again and again and again and again, right? It's just more iterations of the iPhone, right, in technology terms. So as an adult, I've become more aware to the culture, right, that I exist in, the politics of the time, things I agree with, things I don't agree with, and I go on to form my own opinions and curate my world, my media sources, who I allow to talk to me through media and who I don't, right? So understanding that as an adult, it was quite simple to see the world of anime and particularly vintage anime does have its politics. It does have, have its cultural edges and its societal mores, if that's even a word. The world of anime does have its agenda too. It does have its political ideas. It does have its cultural ideas. Like we've discussed earlier, a lot of the animation that came out of um, Asia did have a lot of wartime propaganda embedded into it. A lot of stereotypes, a lot of ideas about how society should and shouldn't work. A lot of philosophical ideas too, right? But the thing is, although those ideas are embedded in animation, as an adult, you're more aware of those ideas because they're now historically documented. You can see, oh, this comes from that, this comes from that. But in modern times, right, with uh, our TV shows and all of that, you see the direct detrimental effect it has on the sleeping people. And I'm not even acting like I'm a wokey because I'm not. There's certain politics I do agree with, certain politics I don't agree with. But I can see how media shapes and forms and moves society in a certain way, right? And I've been immersed in media creation since I was a child, right? I used to do music, I've been around a lot of things, right? So media has always been a part of my life, even down to photography and photoshopping, knowing how propaganda works is just stuff that you pick up as a kid and it progresses, right? So now when I look at things, I can't help but keep on my critical eye, right? I see the things that the normal person doesn't see because like I said, they didn't watch enough how it's made, right? So knowing all that, I knew this is getting to a place where it's gonna damage you more than entertain you, more than inform you. So I'm done with it. I'm not watching any more things produced on Netflix. I'm not watching any more things produced from Hollywood, right? If they're interesting IPs that I know of from the past, things like Resident Evil, things like Batman, right? Even the most recent Batman, I will not watch. I saw a clip of it, I said, no, this is this is that politics, right? It's, this ain't. M. Night Shyamalan, right? This is the new school agenda politics and advertising. It's not the same, right? So, IPs like the Joker, right? Some things I might entertain because I understand the origin of these, these IPs, intellectual properties, for those of you who don't understand what I'm saying, right? But in terms of Hollywood and showmaking, they're not producing anything original. Anything that stands on the the merit of the idea itself, right? They're producing things that already existed and then they're just adding layers of advertising, layers of agendas, layers of politics on top of those ideas. Half of the stories that you actually see in Hollywood are just old Bible stories retold in different ways, right? The, the new scripts and stuff like that, they don't get made. But that's why a lot of people are learning how to make stuff theirself, right? Which is why in the next couple of years, we'll say 20, maybe maximum, a lot of those empires and shit will start to crumble because the quality that people are able to produce on their own, away from the agenda, away from the politics, away from the advertising, is gonna reach to the standard and they're above of what Hollywood and things like Netflix are producing for you now, right? Hence the quality of YouTube videos, all right? So, when it gets there, on its way, right, I will be among the herd of people supporting the originals, right, supporting the good ideas, supporting the good philosophies, the good agendas, right, but I will not partake as it stands at this time. What my neighbours watch, what my mum and them might watch, right, I won't, right, because I know they don't know what the fuck is going on, right, they, EastEnders will be on the TV when they were born and EastEnders will be on the TV when they die, right, so... They have no fucking idea what's going on. So that's one of the reasons why, as an adult, I went back to watching animation. So looking at animation with that same critical eye nowadays, I find anime still offers a certain level of high quality storytelling, which doesn't depend on action happening, trickery being done with CGI and camera moves and stuff like that. Not only does it rely more on high quality storytelling, it still attempts to impart valuable moral lessons, all right? 
nearly every show, nearly every movie still attempts to impart some valuable moral lessons. And not only moral lessons, philosophical ideas, not just to wake up the viewer, just to make the viewer think a little bit and never have to really leave too far from where they exist in life, just enough to know, hmm, why does that happen? And do I recognize these human characteristics in this character in myself, right? They're still attempting to break that programming, that Hollywood, and Hollywood is just a, is a, is a euphemism at this point, right? It's, it's, it's nobody, it's bodies of, companies. So besides anime being a means to liberate yourself from the clutches of corporations, advertising agendas and politics, it's also a rare form of true art. Right? Now, I want you to take anime serious for this reason, if none else. Although anime is a genre or a style of media, it also has genres within it. Just like the idea of movies have different genres, anime also has different genres. Now, of course, the Western world in particular is more accustomed to shonen style animation or battle animation. Things like Dragon Ball Z, things like One Piece, things like Naruto. Now, although those three are the big three kind of bait ones, even Bleach in there, right? Out of those three or four, what I would say is a, is a show like Naruto in between those three attempts to still offer those same moral values, philosophical ideas and quality storytelling, whereas the others are more focused on superpowers and just, just entertainment, right? There's another side of anime, which I like to call alternative anime, right? Just like anime is an alternative media, within the, within the media of music, there's alternative music, right? In any style you want it. So, I'd like to recommend free anime in particular, right? Which don't rely on the idea of fighting or superpowers. It's just high quality storytelling. So the three I will name for this video are these. 91 Days. Days. Terror in resonance. Do you want to destroy it? <laughs> Do you like want to blow it all up? <laughs> You're just a youngster, so you probably can't imagine it. But Tokyo used to be a burnt field. Yeah. Hey, go off! It's been almost 70 years. No. However, this country remains a defeated one. Why are you even with 912? By accident. Remember, you chose this path. And monster. Give me back my husband. Huh? How's he holding up? The bullet is extracted. Very potent, powerful storytelling, ideas, philosophical subject matter, and moral values. If you ever wonder how it is a human can appreciate a drawing so much, you have to know the art and the subtlety of being able to give a drawing, a 2D drawing, 3D emotions. You have to actually understand the human anatomy and the human mind to be able to draw something and animate it that allows a human being to see a human being in the drawing, right? Subtle things like in the show Monster, the people that are more edgy or have a, let's say a darker side to them are subtly drawn with more slanted sharp eyes. Right, and the more positive and righteous characters are drawn with wider eyes, right? Little subtle things like that, right? And this is a easier drawn animation. I'm not saying any animation is easy to draw at all, but it's subtle things like that that is incorporated into the art form that once you watch it enough, right, or you once you see the right types, you can actually see the actual attempt to make acting happen in animation form, right? So to keep it absolutely real with you and honest. When I sat down today, switched on this camera, I wanted to talk about the anime Monster because it's been a very long time since I've been somewhat excited or interested in an anime outside of what the public has been watching, right? Because I did my due diligence and I went before I decided to critique something 
and watched it first, right? So I committed the last few months of my life to watching One Piece, which I kind of regret because it's very uninspiring, but it has its good points too. But because of that long period of time watching One Piece, coming over to a manga of alternative genre like Monster has reinvigorated my interest in animation, right? And storytelling. So, as much as I want to talk about Monster, I haven't even finished watching it myself yet. So, I don't want to ruin it for you or for me, but I feel the next video around this subject will be concerning the anime that is Monster because there's so much to unpack. But for now, please, take anime seriously and go find out how it's made. And also, find out how your favorite stuff is made too, right? So you can stop being a tool, all right? <laughs>